All right. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Welcome back to another one of our live sessions. And of course, this session is for paper two. And the paper that I picked for today is from 2022, November paper 23, the third variant. And this is the second case study in that paper. So um, uh, throughout this, what I've done is I've done all at the end of this session, by the end of this session, we would have done all the November 22, 2022 papers. And then we we're going to move to the June uh, variants, all three of them done across six sessions. Of course, each uh, session, we take one case study and there are two case studies in each paper. All right. So um, some of you may find this familiar from your mock exam. So uh, I think this is a, a good session to show up for. Um, just a few reminders of uh, what it is that we see in the paper two, what are we preparing for? So in total, there are 60 marks at stake. Uh, you will have two case studies identical in the sense that they will each have one business being discussed in it. Um, and what, what the way they make these uh, two case studies that they make sure that they have all five units tested across these two case studies. So you'll see a couple of units more dominant in the first case study and the other three more dominant in the other one or vice versa. So everything, each unit will be tested within your paper two, right? Uh, it's unlike with paper one, of course, in paper one, section A, they ask you about each question is about different unit, but you only are given two choices in section B of paper one. So those are usually uh, each choice is related to a particular department. So there you only have two, but here you will have to prepare for, of course, even there you have to prepare all four, but you don't have to answer for all four units in paper one, but in paper two, you will have to answer for all four units. Okay, so um, each so two identical case studies, each unit is being tested. You will have four uh, questions in each case study, A, B, C, and D. Part A will have uh, two, uh, two subparts with it, one with defining a uh, concept, one with explaining it in a little more detail. Then section, part B will be definitely a calculation question with a short answer question with it. Then part C is an eight mark question and then an 11 mark question to end the case study. So that is a total of 30 marks across two case study, that is 60 marks. Uh, <laughs> Okay, even let's finger crossed. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, so thirty uh, it pay, thirty marks is what we're attempting today. One entire case study, and uh, the business that we have today is called planting pots. So give us an idea well, by the name of the business what they're selling. So planting pots is what they must be selling, right? Um, now the way to approach any paper two case study is to first look at. Uh, the questions and and not uh, as, as in trying to understand how you'll have to answer, but see, but just seeing um, what are the concepts that are going to be tested because you're going to read through the case study once the whole thing and you got to highlight and make notes of where all the important uh, points are for the questions there, right? So it just gives you a better understanding of the case study to just glance over at uh, the question first and then read the entire case study. So let's take a look. Uh, part A is definitions and explaining. So that's batch production and the role of an entrepreneur. So we'll discuss that. Then part B is where they're asking you to calculate um, <clears throat> the change in market share. Okay, so we'll have to find a difference. And this is important. It's very important to read the calculation question carefully to know exactly how they want the answer to be presented. And then one implication, so the impact or their response or whatever you want to include in that, that's what we'll be tested on. Then part C is a question about source of finance, but they're not asking about the different sources of finance, but the question is about two factors that you might consider, you might have to think about when you're considering different sources of finance, okay? And then part D is, question on HR, and this is where we'll have to evaluate different payment methods. Now you remember a discussion of payment methods of, uh, is found within the chapter on motivation. And we know motivation, one side is understanding, which is through all the theories, and the other side of it is uh, actually implementing it, which comes through monetary and non-monetary rewards. And payment methods, of course, will fall under the non-monetary reward. So we are, we're given a table in the case study. We'll have to see how the different uh, types of workers are being paid and if it is the right way to be paying them or not. 
<clears throat> okay, so a bit of HR, a bit of finance, unit one, uh, calculation from marketing, right? So three units clearly dominant here, unit one, three, and five. So let's get to the case study with a sip of water for me. <clears throat> and take off. So uh, this one's called planting pots. Emily and Gabir are entrepreneurs. So we know that there's a part, uh, part A question where they ask you about entrepreneurs. I'm just gonna make a note of them. That's this is where I've seen it. They are both entrepreneurs. In 2012, they set up PP in country K. As the business group, they converted it from a partnership into a public limited company. Kabir and Emily own 50% of the shares between them. So some important pieces of information right away. We know that they are now a public limited company. Yes, they were a partnership, but that's in the past. So our concentration should be what the current situation is, which is that they are a public limited company and they own 50% of the shares. Okay. Now that doesn't mean they have the controlling stake. Controlling stake means 51%. Okay, so they own 50%, but we'll see how this becomes useful later on. It is part C where we discuss sources of finance. That's where this will become important. Okay, uh, PP manufactures decorated pots for plants in its factory in country K. The pots can be used indoors and outdoors. So as soon as you see the type of product that's being uh, sold, make a note of it. Uh, usually helps you with marketing, of course, and understanding the cost of it. So they manufacture decorated pots and they have a place indoors and outdoors in people's homes. <clears throat> the market for decorated pots is growing in country K and the business environment is dynamic. So what does this mean, right? You, you don't just highlight things and go on. You have to make sure you understand what the case is trying to tell you. So one thing that's going in their favor is that the market is growing. So they should be looking for growth because that's, that's the immediate indication that you should get. But when they also say that the environment is dynamic, that means that there are changes in, of course, your pest analysis, your uh, economic, social, environmental, technical, all those elements. But that also means that when you look at the market, yes, there's you, the business, but there are other businesses as well. So this is indicating there's perhaps an increase in competitiveness. That's something that they should expect that they won't be leading. They won't be getting all this new customer base uh, to PP. There will be other competition entering the market. Uh, some data is shown in table 2.1. And here we're given a table where <clears throat> we're given data about market data for uh, decorated pots. So we're given two years data here, 2020 and 2021. Total market sales in country K of decorated pots, three and a half million in 2020, and that increased to 4.1 million in 2021. So overall, they're more, we, whatever the, what the case study was telling us, the, the market is growing, this has been justified here. However, PP's market sales, they have uh, gone up actually from 0.8 million to 0.82 million. But just by looking at these numbers, we get a sense that they haven't grown as much as the market has grown, right? And we'll calculate this in B part one later on. And then we are given the information about uh, the HR side of business, which is related to part D. PP has 90 employees, so that's a big number. Uh, table 2.2 shows some data about PP's employees. And then we're given four types of employees here, creative designers, machine workers, supervisors, and managers. And they're all paid differently. And, and that would make sense because you have different types of jobs being performed here, right? A manager's job is very different from a machine worker, machine worker to a supervisor, supervisor to a designer. So you'll have to pay them differently to, so they stay motivated, right? And, how, and that's what we're seeing here, piece rate, time-based salary and profit sharing. And we also been given their main tasks. So the idea should be that the salary method should be motivating enough and it should match the main task of these employees. And that's what we'll have to evaluate. Is our, for example, our creative designers who are paid piece rate, is this the best way to pay them? Because the objective of their job, the main task is to create new designs for pots. So we'll have to think about this. And, and when we actually just put, take a pause and think about this for a minute, piece rate, pays you according to the number of units you produce. These guys are meant to be creative. Their job is to make creative designs for pods. And surely we know that the problem with P-Thread is that 
quantity takes the lead and quality takes a backseat. And I think quality here is the uniqueness of designs that you need to come up with as a creative designer. So, th so that's the evaluation that we'd have to run with all four, whether it fits them or not. <clears throat> and then the last part, the directors of PP have decided to build an additional factory. So this point is also a continuation of what we saw in the table above, right? They told us that the market was growing and it's getting competitive. So what do you do as a response as a, as a business? Of course, you try to expand and they're thinking of buying in or building an additional factory. The capital cost will be $1.5 million, right? Anytime uh, it's the, the amount is in millions, that, consider that a big amount, right? It, it is a big amount, $1.5 million. And whenever you're taking a large amount like this, you it already narrows you down to your long-term sources of finance, right? Because you can't expect to pay off $1.5 million first year. You can't, maybe medium term might be difficult as well. So if it's a big amount, which in millions is, then you automatically start thinking about long-term sources of finance. The additional factory will allow PP to develop its product portfolio. So what the benefit of doing all of this is that they'll be able to launch newer products, other types of pots, uh, maybe making vases. So, you know, they can they can diversify, they can addition, they can add to their product portfolio, which simply means more types of products. Um, the construction of the factory can start as soon as the directors have decided on a source of finance. And this was um, part C question later on that what are the things that you think about when you are looking for a source of finance the question is not asking not asking us to uh, recommend which sources are best it's simply asking us what are the factors that you look at and there are five factors that that you should remember uh, and it's a, it's a very popular question not asking the sources but asking the factors so one is uh, of course the cost that's 1.5 million, so that means long term. The other is flexibility, right? Maybe uh, the factory is built later, or, so can you pay later as well? Maybe the factory is built earlier, can you pay off the entire amount quickly and not pay interest for a long period of time? So flexibility is important. The amount of additional uh, borrowing you have already. So if you've already taken a loan, a loan before, banks are going to hesitate before going uh, by going ahead and giving you a new loan. So that's something to consider. Uh, the amount of control that you will gain or lose. So uh, if you go towards, let's say, selling shares, then you lose control because that's the... Uh, um, uh, and that's something that being a public limited company, that's got to be important. And the fifth one's just eluding me. Um, uh, the time period that you have for it, right? So cost, flexibility, control, time period, existing borrowing. These are five factors that you look at when you're thinking of taking source of finance A versus taking source of finance B. So those are the things that we will think about in part C. And, and that is the case study. So if I could just quickly recap it for you, it's, an, it's a short one. Uh, the, we, the company is PP, which is a private limited company. Uh, half the shares are owned by the original partners. They sell decorated pots. Market is growing, but it's also bringing in more competition. And that's further uh, shown here by the numbers in table 1.1. Then there uh, is an HR discussion here where different employees are being paid differently. We'll have to see if does that match their main tasks or not. And then lastly, in response to growing demand, there is uh, an intention of making a new factory for $1.5 million. And we have to help the company to decide uh, whether to go ahead with this project or not. And that's the case. Anything that you don't understand from this, like me to go over again. <clears throat> nope, we're good. All right. Then <clears throat> let's get into it. So part A will be similar to section A of paper one. Um, first up, a two mark question. Of course, you will ideally, or not ideally, you should write two points about it. So first point of discussion, the question is define the term batch production. Right, so uh, 
batch production you could define uh, what batch production is and you can give an example of a type of business that might use batch production or two different stages of batch production can be defined so um the way to explain this is that where uh products go through different stages different stages of production together right and an example of this would be let's say a bakery right where the dough and you can give an example the dough for example is made together or you could bake it together Right. Uh, you could also say that it is um, it has more capital as compared to job production. Right. Job production is all about customizing. It's all about using worker skills. When you move from job to batch production, you leave behind the need for skills and you bring in more uh, <clears throat> machines so that the process can be uh, speeded up a little bit. Uh, you can also bring more variety. So and that's also something you can mention here that uh, it also you can make varieties. Okay, I haven't left, left much space for part B, but that's all right, I guess. Let me do a little trick here. Wow. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, <clears throat> that's part A. And then uh, the second part asks us to explain the role of an entrepreneur. And this could, whenever you ask to explain what an entrepreneur does, this is always a combination of the different qualities or the different roles that entrepreneurs are performing, right? So that's what you need to explain here in the second, uh, sorry, wrong tool, uh, or two here. First thing is that entrepreneur is someone who is a risk taker. And of course, explain that what's the sort of risk he's taking, risk taking of starting a business. Right, someone who uh, acquires finances, someone who needs to show leadership qualities, you know, uh, anything else, uh, a good motivator, good manager. So any uh, three qualities combine into a nice little definition plus the roles of an entrepreneur, someone who takes the risk, then what are the roles? Well, they get finance, they show leadership, they motivate, um, and they also need to be creative, creative in what sense and give a little bit of business perspective, a little bit of analysis. So for example, coming up with new products, yeah. right? Motivation for efficiency, right? Or you can talk about increased output. That's something that they can bring about by being a good motivator in the company. So at some some uh, some level of analysis needs to be there in a three mark question. Same in paper one, same in paper two. Are we okay with this one? Any questions? <clears throat> Heyman, are we comfortable so far? <laughs> All right, let's move on. Next up will be part B will be a calculation question and along with that A3 mark, short, uh, short answer as well. So um, always read the first part. They will tell you where to look for information. It says refer to table 2.1 and that's the only information that we need. Um, calculate the change. So this is important. You have to calculate the change. You can't just calculate it for one year. Whenever there's a change, there will be two different points. So they want you to calculate change in PP's market share between 2021 and 2020 and 2021. So this change is what they want you to figure out here. 
whenever they're asking you to change, two numbers must be uh, uh, subtracted from one another. Okay, so um, let's let me just first show you uh, the formula of market share. Okay, so my part one is here, uh, market share is equal to uh, company sales divided by industry sales. into 100, which means that this will always be a percentage. You must show the right unit in your answers. All right, so this is what we gotta do. And remember, you have to find the difference between the two years. So what I'm gonna do here is just, just make a division here of the two years for 2020 and 2021, okay? So uh, PP uh, and industry, those are the numbers we need. And let's just, Go to the table. In 2020, market sales were 3.2, PP was 0.8. So 0.8 divided by 3.2, right? So this will become 0.8 divided by 3.2 into 100. Would someone be kind enough to calculate this for me, please? And the other one was, when I quickly look at that, 0.82 divided by 4.1. So this would be 0.82 divided by 4.1 into 100. Uh, so the first one is 25%. Thank you, Ramin. And the second one, 20%. Thank you again. Right Now, remember, they need you to find the difference between the two. That's the answer. So we can clearly see that from 2020 to 2021, it actually decreased. And the decrease minus 5% is the change in market share. So this is the right answer, 5% decrease. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, everybody okay? Simple, just calculate for both years, find the difference. <clears throat> And and this, whatever this number is, whatever the calculation is, it, it will hold a very uh, significant meaning for the second part, right? So we found out that, okay, this company's uh, APP's market shares are actually fallen, which means competition is getting stronger and you're getting weaker against the competition, right? That's all that market share tells us. How are you faring against the rivals who are selling the same product? So we know that they are not doing so well. They've actually lost ground by 5%. Part two is related to that, that explain one implication for PP of a fall in market share. So implication means that how is this going to impact them and how are they going to respond? What is going to be their reaction? Okay, so what does it imply? The word implication comes from imply. Imply means having a meaning on something else. So when this happens, how does it impact the entire company? And how should PP respond? That's what you would have to explain in a question like this. Okay. And whenever you get a question, calculation question on market share, I've seen about 80% of the time, this is the same question that comes up with it. So uh, it becomes doubly important here. Right. So I'm just going to solve it to the side here. I know that it has fallen by 5%. Right? That's what it is. And what does it mean now? The simple development here, I'm going to do. Uh, or two here. Always start with the application. Okay, so first point is there is a fall of five percent in market share. What does that mean? It means that you're becoming less competitive. That's literally what fall in market share means, right? You are falling in competitiveness. What does that mean? That means you are losing customers. And how will you have to respond? Remember, how would you find out about market share? Through market research, right? You would find out how everybody else is doing, how you are doing, then you will run these numbers. And whatever you find out from your market research, what do we do with it? We implement it 
uh, we implement changes in our marketing mix, right? So that's something that you can mention here. So maybe uh, increasing their product portfolio. And why am I talking about that? Because that's been, or that's already been mentioned in the case study, right? They're thinking of building a new factory. So maybe they should get serious about that. But that's more long-term, right? Building a factory, taking finance is gonna come in a while. You could say, maybe you can look to reduce your prices. And that's one way to have an impact. But loss of uh, <clears throat> lowering your prices could mean loss of revenue. So uh, it will have to be fully developed starting from the calculation answered in part one. So we saw foreign market share. These two points are kind of the same that when you become less competitive, you start losing customers. And as a business, you must respond by either bringing more variety, lowering the prices, improving your promotion, any way that you can improve your uh, marketing mix that can be uh, supported here in the end. So a bit of analysis uh, application and a bit of analysis both combined is what you need for B part two. Okay, B part two is all about application and analysis. Um, questions? Can we talk about loss of sales in this part? Yeah, so in the end, you know how I mentioned loss of revenue, you could say loss of sales as well. This is what could be a positive impact of them losing market share. But then that's just half of it, right? You Loss of sales is coming from here, right? Losing customers is loss of sales. But how do you respond? That also needs to be there. Because this is just uh, loss of customers and loss of sales will all, only be explaining the application part. Look, this is happening. But we also have to respond. That also needs to be part of this. So either one of four and five. <clears throat> okay. Shall I move on? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now <clears throat> we get to the part about sources of finance. And since this is an eight mark question, we know that we have to talk about knowledge, application, analysis only. There's no need for evaluation in an eight mark question. And it's always a good idea to first divide your question into these elements, so let's do that. The question is, analyze two factors which may affect PP's choice of a source of finance to build the additional factory. So when I read the question carefully, I can see that the part of knowledge is surely coming from sources of finance, right? As long as I talk about that, I will get my marks for knowledge. Application, where is this being discussed when they're thinking of building a new factory? So I'll have to look at that part of the case study or anything that is linked to that. Analysis is not us making a choice, but they're asking us for two Factors which affect the choice of a source of finance. And as we discussed them a little bit earlier, they are cost, flexibility, uh, or, uh, existing borrowing, all those factors. So that's what we have to see that if they decide to build a factory, they will have to find a source of finance. But when choosing this, what are the factors that you need to think about? So Whenever they're asking about factors, uh, your points should be the factors, not the source of finance. I, what I mean is that you shouldn't say, oh, they should take a loan because of this reason. You should say, look, this factor is important. And based on that factor, they should choose this source of finance. So you should lead with the factor, not with the source of finance in a question like this. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of what we were given in the case study about this topic. Uh, and... We're told here that the directors have, of PP have decided to build an additional factory. The capital cost will be one and a half million dollars. So we already established that this is going to be some form of long-term source of finance. The additional factory will allow PP to develop its product portfolio. So that's what something that you can uh, include in your analysis of your points that look, this is the reason why we're doing it. 
Um, and the construction of the factory can start as soon as the directors have decided on a source of finance. So this last sentence is where we find ourselves in the case study that we are here. Consider yourself here as a consultant to a director. And actually on that point, something that I should um, have been saying in every class is that the best way to approach a case study is not by becoming the owner of the business. Okay, and that's and that's that will give you a very limited perspective because then you'll only be thinking about the profitability or you know making money for the owners. The way you should look, you should approach a case study is that you should become a consultant to that business. Okay, someone's coming to you uh, for uh, advice. So here, Emily and Kabir have come to you as a consultant for advice. And when you come, when somebody wants advice from you, you don't just tell them do this, do this. You do you tell them, look, this is what you can do. This is what you can do. This could be my recommendation. This is what will impact your customers. This is what will impact your shareholders, your employees. So. Always take a perspective where you are advising to the business, right? And this is also don't necessarily be the directors, be an advisor. Look, well, this is you should. These are the factors that are important whenever you're considering a source of finance and whatever source of finance you're considering first to get these factors. So always become sort of a consultant when you are uh, trying to attempt a, a case study, uh, and and do it over a few papers at home. Also, when you're practicing, it will become second nature, and you will see a bit a change, and you will see that your answer writing. It's become according to different stakeholders and not just thinking about that, I got to save the business. Okay, so uh, let's go to our answer here. And uh, actually, if you could just give me a second. Uh, lines make my job a lot easier. So, <laughs> fine. Okay, uh, so here we are. Now, um, there is no way to properly define source of finance here, right? I mean, how do you define all the different sources? There are about 18 or 20 into one definition, right? But what you can say is that whenever, when, one, when do you use a source of finance when you are looking to expand? So we can maybe give a flavor of that the business is looking to expand by building a new factory. So it's always, always a good practice to start by developing the knowledge and application together in the first paragraph. Okay, examiners like that. So if I have to explain anything here, I can define here uh, the objective of expansion or what we also know as growth. And what it simply means, it means buying more resources. And how is the company doing that? This is where you bring in the application, right? You talk about that PP is uh, thinking of building a, an additional factory. And in order to do that, they need to decide on a source of finance. Right? Often I get questions from students that my eight mark questions are not long enough, especially in paper two. And that's because um, often we miss out the importance of the first paragraph here of, you know, bit of knowledge and application. You, you don't have to have a definition here, right? I could have just simply said that when they're looking, PPP is looking to grow and that's where they are thinking of buying an additional factory. That's also perfectly fine. But at least it sets the tone that the question is about source of finance and I'm talking about that. Okay, And then the application sandwich with it in the first paragraph. And in order to do this, we need to, uh, consider some factors. I remember the question is about factors, not about recommending sources of finance. So that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first thing to talk about here, uh, let's say we talk about control. And the reason why I'm talking about that should be the application and should be the leading, the lead of your point. They, they are a public limited 
company. Right? And right now, uh, I'm going to write E and K for Emily and Kabir have 50% control. Right, that's still substantial. 50% in two people. Yes, they were the original partners. They would want to retain that. So that's what they're doing. But one of the sources that you can consider is selling more shares for uh, to raise the $1.5 million. And use numbers whenever you can in your answers. It's good for application. Okay? Now you can sell more shares, but what happens is that when you sell more shares, the original owners lose control. Right? And since Emily and Kabir are original owners. I'm going to call it partners because it was a partner with partnership before. Since they're original partners, um, how willing would they be? Right? Because their own 50% is bound to go down when you sell more shares. <clears throat> Um, so the comment here that factor for how long they need it for, I'm going to talk about that as well as the second point. I, I, I thought control is an important point here because, and, and, and th whenever you're thinking of long-term sources of finance, always think about, in fact, I should just talk about that here for a minute. So we know that you divide your sources of finance into short-term, medium-term, long-term sources of finance, right? But whenever you're thinking of long-term sources of finance, at the end of the day, everything is divided into two simple uh, two simple types. Either you go for equity finance or you go to something called debt finance. Equity finance is where you sell shares, right? And that's something being a public limited company, this uh, PP can surely do. Debt finance is anything where you have to pay interest. And there are many examples of it. You can take a long-term bank loan. You could sell debentures. Or you could get a mortgage. They are all long-term. And mortgage is usually for land. And since we're talking about a factory, a land must be involved. So we can talk about that here as well. There is no mention of debentures here. So we cannot mention it at all. So, so that's another point that I want to talk about is that when you are uh, when you are uh, attempting paper two case studies and, and a question like this, there may be multiple sources of finance that you can use, but it doesn't mean that you can suggest any one that you like. You have to suggest those that fit into the information that's given in the case study. So, if there's any place, any mention of a public limited company, then you can talk about shares. That should be the first thing you talk about. If they are taking a, a piece of land, for example, factory, then you can talk about mortgages or a loan. Loan can be taken for a um, piece of land as well. So look for clues and try to match your suggestions that meet the clues from the case study. That's that's very, very cr critical when it comes to application here. Uh, uh, I have a question here. Private limited companies can also raise equity finance. Yes, they can, but they sell it privately to people they trust and only in small portions. You can't raise large sums of capital to build a factory like that. Okay. And since they already are a public limited company, that's an option that is available to them. When you're comparing private to public, they can both sell shares, but the level that public limited companies can sell at and the level that they can raise is so much more than what private limited companies can do. And the whole objective was private limited is, is about keeping the control in the hands of the few. That's why you remain private. Otherwise, you would go public. Who doesn't like more money, right? But the idea is to remain in control of the business, yet still have limited liability and more uh, money coming in from other shareholders. So, so, so it's, a, it's a matter of objectives between private and public limited. Does that make sense, Mubash, uh, Muzamil? Um, 
they can go for crowdfunding, but crowdfunding Maya is small amounts from a lot of people. So this is one and a half million dollars. Can you imagine how many people you would need to get to this? And usually crowdfunding is done for new businesses, right? For unique ideas. This isn't new. This isn't unique. So again, there are so many sources, but crowdfunding doesn't fit into this. Not at all, right? I mean, you could think of a venture capitalist, but that would be similar to control point, right? That you will lose control. So look for something that's different. So I think we can talk about a loan or we can talk about a mortgage very easily in this, in this question. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go to the second point. And the second thing to consider would be the uh, length you will need it for, or the time of borrowing. Right, And this is where, obviously, you will lead with the application that how much do you need? You need one and a half million dollars. Right, that's a big amount. And of course, making a factory is not a small decision, right? So you will be making sure that you have every every angle covered, including the uh, uh, the financial side of it. And since it's one point five million, then a long term source is recommended. And why that's also important so that you can pay over a longer period. And the benefit of doing that is it improves profitability. Remember, you pay interest on your loan, so it reduces your profit. And when cash leaves the business, it also impacts your cash flow. So if you are able to make smaller payments over a longer period of time, that's always better for a business rather than making larger payments in a smaller period of time. So since this is one and a half million, <clears throat> you will need more time to pay it off because you also are struggling in your business right now. It will take you some time to catch up, start making sales. So that's the argument that you can make here. And uh, so for that, then you can take a long-term bank loan or since this is a property i think mentioning a mortgage would be better here okay so uh, again length of period uh, length of borrowing since you want to be over a long period of time this is the source that we would recommend here <clears throat> okay uh, however we also know again the point that you will have to uh, interest what that does is it reduces profits and why is that important here they are a public limited company the shareholders aren't going to be happy about that of course right you could also talk about uh, existing borrowing for example but there is no mention of any existing borrowing on the business so there is no place for it like once again i will emphasize the point there are there, any concept will have many points that you can write about right but you only talk about those points in paper to case study for which there are clues mentioned in the case so again, we're given the amount, so we can talk about length of time. We know that that's long-term borrowing. We were given the fact that they're a public limited company, we can talk about shares. If they weren't a public limited company, we wouldn't be talking about shares because that option is not on the table. So it must match the information. Uh, and that's very different from paper one, right? In paper one, you talk about anything that you want to. Uh, so yeah, that's this answer. Your questions, please. We're good. <clears throat> okay, let's move on then to the last question. And where did it go? Here it is. Once again, I'm going to need some lines here. Yeah. 
Okay, so here is the question. Part D will be an 11 mark question. And whenever you have an 11 mark question, that means you need to talk about all four elements, knowledge, application, analysis, and evaluation. <clears throat> okay, so it's asked us to refer to table 2.2 and other information. So we'll look at everything that we can get our hands on. Evaluate, so we already know this is an evaluate question, right? That means we'll have to look at other factors, two-sided answer. That's something that we'll have to see. Does it work? Does it not work? If it's not working, what do you recommend, right? Um, evaluate PP's use of different payment methods. So we know that is part of knowledge here. Payment methods, that falls under motivation. So we can talk about that here. For its employees, clearly when we're talking about payment methods, that's the application here talking about employees. Analysis is, of course, does it work? We have to see, is this use the right move for them? If not, what else should you recommend? So we've seen that table. I'm going to take you to that table again. And that's where we'll have to see, are the employees being uh, paid in the right way, matching their main tasks or not? Basically, that's what the question is asking us. So here we are. <clears throat> and... This is all the information that we need from PP here till the end of the table. The, how do I know that? Because no other HR discussion uh, was found anywhere else in the case data, right? If there was any other HR discussion, then I would also include that here if need be. Uh, so a PP has 90 employees and then table 2.2 shows some data about PP's employees. And whenever you're given a table like this, you have to talk about all four types, okay? You can't be choosing, you have to talk about all four, and we simply have to see whether they're paid the right way or not, keeping in mind that that's what motivation is. <clears throat> so the first type, creative designers are being paid through a piece rate payment method. And the main task is to create new designs for pots. And we already discussed this a little bit earlier that the whole point of creative designers is to be unique, is to be innovative, and piece rate doesn't do that. So that's right away in a, in a problem that we can find with the first type of uh, employees here. I think we should start developing our answer. Do it side by side. So um, <clears throat> now it would be uh, not wrong, but a little uh, off the mark, inappropriate to define payment methods, right? Because the main concept that payment methods uh, is found under is motivation. So if you were to define, you would define here what motivation is. Right, and this is obviously uh, for people to work harder. It's a combo. What's more important than that? It's a combo of uh, monetary and non-monetary rewards. Right? Why am I focusing on that? Because the question is about that. The question is about the monetary rewards. Right, and. You can also bring in, obviously, you should bring in application here. You can talk, bring other factors from the case study that look there. Uh, uh, their sales are falling, and that's where motivation is even more important right now, right? So they are facing falling sales. And this is where you need HR support, right? And we're going to evaluate the appropriateness of methods. Right, this is important for motivation. Um, so let's talk about the first one and uh, we will talk about the creative designers first. Okay. Lead with the main task that their job is to create uh, different art designs.
right? Um, and what's important is that they need to have some sort of innovation. Um, actually, I'm not gonna talk about that here. That's not application. Application is talking about things from the case to right? And currently they're being paid using a piece rate system. Now my analysis comes to this, that piece rate focuses on quantity. And when that happens, focuses on quantity. And when that happens, what's the result? Quality suffers. And since there is a need to be uh, creative, which is basically what the quality of these pots are, right now, piece rate is inappropriate for these guys. <laughs> Okay, uh, so your suggestion to this problem would then become the evaluation. It will also count as evaluation, not just evaluation by itself, but will also be a part of your evaluation. Remember evaluation is done at any point in your answer. It's not just the last paragraph. Okay, so uh, if it's not piece rate, well, I have a suggestion here. Uh, Eamon says performance pay, right? So maybe we can, um, we can define in their objectives that you need to come up with at least 10 different designs or 20, however, right? 10 per person. So you need to come up with 10 different designs. If you do that, then you get paid. And that could be uh, a way of setting performance related pay. So that could be an, uh, a suggestion here and you could change to performance related pay. And how do you do that? Objective of creating a certain number of certain number of designs. So if you can come up with many varieties, then you get paid, right? But the problem is performance related pay <clears throat> And you can use <clears throat> any one disadvantage here that will also be part of the evaluation is that when you give people performance related pay, there might be uh, favoritism. So some people may get easier targets, some may get others. So there might be conflict because of different or easier targets assigned. Right, so a problem would be a good way to end this point here. <clears throat> so we have a suggestion, but there is also a, a problem associated with us. We've done that. Um, let's get to the next one. Next one is machine workers. So uh, by the way, creative designers would surely be in marketing. Machine workers will be in operation. Supervisors, operation, managers in all departments. All departments need managers, right? So we've looked at it from a marketing perspective. Let's see operations. And workers are different from supervisors, right? Workers must complete their tasks. And what are the tasks that are given to them? They need to produce batch. Uh, they uh, main task is batch production of pots. So they must be given certain targets that you need to finish X number of batches or X type of batches within one year, one year, one week, however they're evaluated. And if you look at this, they're given a time-based payment method. Now, the problem with time-based payment method is that it does nothing for motivation. When you're getting paid for the number of minutes you spend at work, you don't really want to work some hours, some hours you're productive, some hours you're just lazing around, not doing much. So it is not good for motivating workers to produce more. And you want your workers to be producing more output so that you can sell more output. You're already losing your market share to your competition, right? So again, there's a problem here with time-based. So <clears throat> I'm gonna use this in my answer. Their task is batch production of pots. 
right? Uh, so this is your machine workers. Uh, they produce batches of parts and they must be given uh, targets of number of batches. They are currently being paired using a time-based payment method. And identifying the problem of time-based payment method would start the analysis for this point. Uh, so the problem is that uh, this is not motivational for operations work. Right? Always the best solution for workers is peace rate. Right? Peace rate, you want them to produce more, you want to you make more money, make more pots. That's always the best way to motivate your uh, factory workers or machine worker. So this is not good for operations workers. Uh, it's not motivational. Um, other hand, just define the problem here. It doesn't uh, encourage. So doesn't encourage to uh, improve productivity. <clears throat> right? I'm sorry. Uh, so my suggestion here would be that they should change to piece rate. Right? Why? That's good for output plus motivation, right? Workers make more money, company makes more output. It's a win-win for both. <clears throat> Again here, the problem is that what happens to the quality? Right. Uh, it's important because you are <clears throat> operating in a business, in an industry that's becoming more and more competitive. So that's a problem there. You can mix that up there, right? So <clears throat> you can talk about that. Um, then, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, are we okay? I hope I'm not speeding to this uh, too hastily. Right. if there's a question, just write in the Q&A, I'll answer it. Let's look at the third one now. Again, an operations worker, but this time they're supervisors. Okay, supervisors' jobs are very different. Supervisors are being paid according to, uh, are paid through salaries, and their main task is uh, supervise creative designers and machine workers. So supervisors, they would have in both departments. So there's a correction here that this is not just for operations. We're looking at um, what happened there. Sorry, give me a second. This is also for all. Okay, so uh, their job is to supervise both the operations workers as well as the marketing workers, and they're being paid salary. Okay, now do you think if salaries are okay for supervisors? Do you think it will motivate them to keep a good eye on people? Do you think, given the type of work they have, that's the only way they can be paid? What do you think? Are salaries good for motivation? Perhaps not, right? The whole problem with salaries is that when you know you're getting paid no matter what, then you're not going to go look for problems in the creative workers and the machine workers' jobs, right? You're just going to sit there, take your salary home, and just be gone. But 
if you could change it. So highlight the problem here that this is uh, not good for motivation. Why? Because it's not linked to output. Right? Surely that's a problem there. So um, what's the result of this? It's going to result in poor design since you won't be so motivated to look at creative designers. Plus uh, lower output, your workers might be getting away with things because the supervisors are not doing their jobs. So what do you suggest? Yeah, we can go time-based, absolutely. Uh, profit sharing. Um, so supervisors uh, would own, usually get a very, very small percentage of profit sharing, right? So we can talk about that problem. You can put them a profit sharing that will give them an objective to work towards it. But the supervisors get as a percentage very less as compared to your managers or your directors, right? So that argument can be made there. If we, if we go time-based, then you can get the more hours they work, the more they'll be supervising, the better the designs and uh, output is going to be. You can also talk about that. So any anyone here would be okay. Um, I'm going to talk about profit sharing, okay? Uh, so maybe you could... Sorry, my hands are getting a bit sweaty. Uh, change to profit sharing. Right? And that should be good for increasing the performance. Right? And how are they performing by providing better supervision? Right? Um, the problem with that is with profit sharing is that uh, supervisors will get a smaller percentage of profit. Right? Does that is that really going to be motivating or not? Uh, that's something that we don't know, but we can pose a question in our evaluation. That's perfectly fine. Okay, let's look at the last type of worker managers across all departments. They are being paid through profit sharing. They're about making uh, making decisions in functional areas. So managing uh, marketing director, operations, finance, HR, those are the managers that we are looking at here. <laughs> um, so, um, Eamon, are you talking about the previous point that if you start sharing your profit, uh, your shareholders might have something to say about that? Sure, you can talk about that as well. Absolutely. In fact, we can include that point in this one here with managers, right? P managers are being paid through profit sharing, sharing, and that's reducing the amount of dividend that's going to the shareholders. And that's probably the problem here, right? And their main task is to make decisions, right? And decisions aren't made uh, through profit. Maybe decisions can be made. They can be paid a salary, right? Look, take this amount. You do your job according to what your role is. And that's perfectly fine. Profits, and if you do still take, stick with profit sharing for managers, they might argue, look, we don't get paid if we don't make a profit. So that's also not working in their favor. So you can also do that here. Uh, Ramin, do you mean two to three types of employees or two to three points per employee? So just going to finish up with the last one. So you need to discuss at least three, at least three for sure. I'm, uh, Let's just let's just leave it. Okay, let's just talk about the fourth one as well, right? So this is my fifth point here. I'm gonna make this one quick so we can look to evaluate the question in the end. So here, their job is to make decisions, right? Plus, they're being paid through profit sharing. Uh, the problem is that, of course, conflict for shareholders. Why are you giving away our profit to the employees? Uh, plus, 
no reward if no profit, right? So that's something that the managers will complain about. Uh, and here you can evaluate by saying that perhaps you should change to uh, paying them a salary, right? Uh, they can focus on their departments and you know just that argument that can be made here. Profit sharing can make managers focus on short-term profits. Yeah, so we can talk about that. They only worry about profits and not looking at business growth, developing the workforce. You can also talk about those things. Absolutely, Muzammar. <clears throat> okay, now, so we, so what we've done is we've looked at the different types of employees and, and in, in, in proper detail, how it should be knowledge, application, analysis, evaluation. We, we've been doing it throughout the answer, right? But for, for an 11 mark question, you need to, um evaluate the entire answer as well towards the end that we've and what have we done so far we've referred to table 2.2 but we haven't looked at another type of information right so uh we also know that they have 90 employees that's a lot of people to uh manage so besides payment methods there might be other things or they might be looking for so maybe providing them some non-monetary words more delegation, more decision making, putting them together in teams. That's also an important part of motivation, right? And we already mentioned that earlier on that they need to be provided non-monetary rewards along with the monetary reward. So that could be my final evaluation. That look, <clears throat> you have to consider the non-monetary rewards as well. There are 90 employees. So there's going to be many types of uh, contracts and many types of payment methods anyway. So it will, it will increase your administrative costs. You'll have to focus on good HR systems within the business so that you're able to manage this going forward, right? So those are those are uh, comments that are directly answering the question. So so if the last evaluation is all about directly answering the question as a result of your evaluation, right? So what have we evaluated? Well, clearly it's not working. We're looking to change. And I mean, we're evaluating the different methods of payment for its employees. We're saying, look, 90 employees, you're not, there's no mention of non-monetary rewards. So that's all, those are the things that I need to include in the end. So that's my uh, final evaluation here. Okay, uh, what about the non-monetary rewards? Right, there's also 90 employees, so there's a lot of administration. Uh, it also depends on the right leadership style of managers, of course, and supervisors. That will also be a part of HR. Um, anything else you guys might want to add? How would uh, how would you evaluate a question like this? Um, well, I can also say that there is a uh, increased competition. So as a result, might lose workers to your competition, right? That is what you call poaching. When your competition comes in and takes your trained workers. So that's also something to consider and get your house in order uh, from an HR perspective. So this is what we've created. Uh, do we have questions? Any part? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, empowerment of quality circles can help motivate them by giving them some authority. Yeah, so you can mention one or two uh, non monetary rewards. You should in the end. Yeah. What else?
Are we okay? We're satisfied. Your silence would suggest that. <laughs> All right, then if the of oh, sure, it's clear. All right, you're welcome. So uh that's it from me then. If everything's clear, I hope you have more clarity on these topics. Uh in our next session, we'll start off with a new case study. Uh until next time, thank you for being here. Take care. Good luck with your preparations. Bye-bye.